Welcome to this Christmas service. This is a more informal service after the events of Christmas Eve, and we're back to having Nellie and I, Nellie being my main audience and participant in the service. Thank you, Nellie. It's more of an informal gathering. Last year, we were able to have a breakfast affair, a little brunch, and some song and music and stories. So we'll try to keep things a little more informal for this morning's service. Uh, afterwards, uh, this presentation, I'd love if you would join me on a Zoom call around 11 a.m. to offer Christmas greetings to each other and uh, maybe a reflection or two on the meaning of Christmas. So look for that link in the newsletter and uh, we'd love to have you join us. Um, the office will be closed from the 24th until at least January 4th, but probably with the lockdown, uh, we'll continue to work remotely with email and phone calls and uh, the occasional time being in the office. Uh, next week, I'm away for January the 3rd, and Leslie Morris will be leading in worship. So join her in a virtual service for that beginning of the new year. This is the life and ministry of St. Paul's as we gather even in this virtual way. So we welcome you to this first Sunday in the Christmas season. We have traveled towards the light in Advent, and now we enter into a couple of weeks of Christmas, Christ Mass, the celebration, the feast of Christ with us as a newborn baby, and the 
implications of what that humble birth mean for us. We begin the storytelling again in the Christian year from anticipating the birth of Jesus through his birth and into his life and ministry as we travel through the year. We light this candle of solidarity to represent our commitment to following the ways of Jesus, ways of compassion and justice and inclusion for all. So let us join in this celebration of new life, new light, new ways of entering into being Christians in the world today. Let us worship together. This story is called On a Snowy Night, and the author is Jean Little. Rosa Rabbit wanted to bite somebody. When Rosa was given to Brandon on his fifth birthday, he had shouted, she's better than perfect, Mom. He stroked her and fed her bits of carrots and apples from his fingers. She nibbled, but she never once bit him. Who loves Rosa Rabbit, he asked her, but soon he would answer, I do. And Rosa Rabbit was happy. But now, Rosa was not happy at all. Brandon had grown big, and he was too busy playing with boys to bother with a rabbit very often. Rosa watched Brandon's sister showing her guinea pig the Christmas tree. Tonight we hang up our stockings, she said. I'm so excited, I could hardly wait. Rosa Rabbit was not excited. She was hungry and lonely and sure nobody loved her. Suddenly, Brandon burst in. No, what, Rosa Rabbit? It's snowing again. It's almost a blizzard. Rosa probably doesn't remember what snow is, his sister said. Brandon lifted Rosa out of her cage. He held her tight and ran back out into the winter's dusk. He put her down gently in a stretch of fresh snow. How do you like the snow, Rosa? He asked. Just then, his mother called. Brandon, telephone! I'm coming, he yelled as he raced for the house. Rosa waited and waited for him to come back. A gust of wind sent a burst of snowflakes right into her eyes. When Brandon still did not come, she tried to follow his footprints, but it was dark, and she could not see them any longer. She was lost. Fluff up your feathers, said a small, clear voice. Rosa gazed at the little bird. I, I don't have feathers, she, 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 she said through ch ch chattering teeth. Well, maybe we could help, chirped the bird. A flock of tiny chickadees flew down to her. They fluffed up their down to make a soft, busy blanket against the biting wind. One hopped up between Rosa's soft ears and asked if that helped. Rosa nodded, but she was still shivering. Look who's here, peeped another of the birds. Rosa lifted her head and peered through the swarming snowflakes. A creature with a tall tail appeared and dropped something right in front of her. The chickadees twittered. The squirrel went behind Rosa and gave her a push. Rosa jumped forward, and her ice-cold front paws landed on something. She moved around until she could get all four paws onto it. The chickadees tumbled off her back and whirred up in a cloud of wings. Rosa knew that mitt. It was Brandon's. She almost smiled as she settled onto the wonderful warmth of wool. Thanks, she mumbled to the squirrel. 
But all around her, the snow deepened. I'll get you something to eat, said a loud voice. A raccoon waddled across to a tall white shape nearby. He scrambled up it and came back with a carrot. He dropped it right in front of Rosa. I think it's supposed to be a nose, he said. Rosa bit into the carrot. Never before had any food tasted so delicious. She really likes it, the raccoon boasted. We can see that, buddy, snapped a mouse, peering up with longing. Rosa knew how it felt to be hungry. Every so often, Brandon forgot to feed her. She rolled the last little bit of carrot away with her nose and watched the mouse pounce upon it. For a moment, she almost felt warm. Rosa Rabbit stared around at her new friends. I thought wild animals ate each other, she said. Not on this night, said a voice from a tree branch high above. Even tasty little morsels like you are safe tonight. It's a hawk, cheeped the chickadee, trying to sound brave. Rosa gazed up into the shadowy branches and remembered the Christmas tree in the warm house. Far away, someone was calling. I must go home, she said. My boy will be in trouble. She stared into the darkness and trembled. But I don't know where home is. You need to turn around, the hawk said. I can guide you. I know where your boy lives. Rosa tried to move forward, but her paws felt stiff in spite of the mitten's warmth, and the snow was so deep. I, 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 I'm stuck, she whimpered. No, don't be silly. You can hop, said the mouse. He's right, said the raccoon. Be brave. Then Rosa remembered Brandon shouting, She's better than perfect. I can, she told herself and she hopped with all her might. As she sprang out of the snow, the hawk swooped down and flew ahead. The others followed after him. Soon, they were in front of the house. Brandon was just coming out the door. Rosa gazed up at him. Then she looked back at all the creatures who had helped her when she was lost and afraid. Thank you, everyone, she said. As they scampered and flew away, she hopped up the porch steps and thumped with her hind foot. Brandon looked down and saw her. For one moment, he stared at her, not believing his eyes. Then he leaped forward and he lifted her into his arms. Oh, Rosa! When I couldn't find you, I thought I'd lost you forever, Brandon cried. She could have bitten him then, but she did not think of it. Her arms and his arms were warm, and she snuggled close. He did not need to tell her who loved Rosa Rabbit. She knew.
Let us come into a time of prayer. Let us pray. In the spirit of comfort and joy, we come into this Christmas season. The spirit of joy that emerges in this story of a humble birth of God with us, God Emmanuel. A humble birth representing a world transforming idea of God with us, with each of us offering us the benefits and the beauty, the expectations of a spiritual and a deep and wondrous, joyful life. This is the gift of this Christmas time. We need words of comfort in this season as we face the fears around us with the increased COVID, the COVID disease and its implications and its challenges in our society, how it's curtailed many of our gatherings, our opportunities of being together in this Christmas time. So we offer comfort to each other in long distance ways and we offer comfort to those who are affected by this pandemic. We offer comfort to the many who feel lost or lonely or hurting in this season. To those who are facing challenges of illness to those who are facing challenges of violence and persecution and injustice, whether here or around the world. We offer our prayers of comfort and solidarity, our prayers that the peace and justice making and love of this season might find its way into these systems and into these communities into the world around, changing it to one of joy and appreciation of the beauty of life. This is our deep calling for ourselves and for our community, a calling of the divine to us as God incarnate in our lives and in the community around. We take this incarnation, a humble birth, living with peasants and challenging the systems of the day, challenging them to recognize that the foundations of life and caring is one of love and mutuality of seeking joy and beauty in life. So in this Christmas season, we offer this, our hope for joy, our reveling in it, and also the spirit of comfort to all who need it. May this be our prayer this Christmas Sunday.
The scripture this morning is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. Jesus is presented in the temple. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are di dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Jerusalem, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and pray, prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. So what does Christmas mean to you? Now that we're past Christmas Day and we're taking a deep breath on this Sunday, Maybe the first Sunday of the lockdown announced for yesterday. 
Maybe it's time to be reflective. Maybe we have an opportunity to be a little more reflective this year about what Christmas means to us. Usually it's a rush of family and different activities and things that keep us busy during this Christmas season and we're happy for a break. But in all the difference of this year, maybe it's time that we can use to think a bit more about the significance of what Christmas means to us these days. It's a time of celebration, Christ Mass, a time of feasting, the feasting, the birth of Christ. The word Mass means feast or at table. And so it's a time of celebrating this event of the narrative, the story around Christmas. It's often lost these days in the so many activities and uh, the busyness of family and of gifts and the storytelling and all of the things that bring us together at this Christmas time. For some of us, it's a challenging time. It evokes uh, going to places that are part of deep uncertainties or history that uh, I've tried for a long time to figure out that uh, it's a challenge. I'm not sure if it's family dynamics or the commercialization of Christmas or Muzak that goes on forever. Something about this season at the gut level kind of has me in a spin. At the heart, I appreciate all the good things of Christmas and togetherness and what all that means. But I know it's uh, not easy for everyone. And so it is a time to be reflective of what all this has meant. I'm hoping in our conversation in the Zoom call after this church service that uh, you might have some reflections for yourself. This time of Christmas is one that uh, has been lost in many ways in the secular society. And as I noted on Christmas Eve, many describe it as one story amongst many that are out there to celebrate this season. It's a, a nice story of uh, birth and angels and shepherds and all of those good things. But when I think about this Christ Mass story, there's some significance to it that takes us to its most profound level. This is a story that literally changed the world, that has had an impact on the last 2,000 years of our thinking. It's a story that resonates deeply in the consciousness of Western civilization. It's a story that represents a pivot in religious thinking. Earliest peoples, we know, saw the whole world as spiritual. They lived amidst the spirits. As times evolved and communities grew, uh, there became an understanding of different gods representing different elements of nature and different personalities uh, that were around and the wind and the water and the sea and so on uh, represented the sky god and mother earth and so we got this polytheistic understanding of the divine world this evolved again in more complex society into a sky god and monotheism emerges. In this sky god, we have Yahweh, a distant, omnipotent god, distant from uh, the earth, represented in the burning bush, in powerful symbols, images of judgment, of, of divine power and omnipotence. The profound thing of this 
Christ's story is it represents God in this omnipotence come to us incarnated part that God is with us and not only with us in terms of elites, in terms of powerful authorities, but here in a story of a humble birth, representing the most humble amongst us, peasants surrounded by a rural situation, surrounded by shepherds, the lowliest of the economic ladder. This is a profound shift in how we understand God with us. The story that Donna Jean read today is one that uh, looks to this new reality. Isaiah had predicted it 800 years before, and that's why we read the Isaiah stories at this time. It's a story that anticipates God with us in this humble way. And so being presented at the temple, Mary and Joseph being good Jews, making the, the pilgrimage to the temple to present their newborn child, part of the whole Jewish life around temple culture. And in the presentation and the recognition by uh, Simeon and Anna, recognize a male and a female voice. Luke is good about this gender recognition, Mary, Joseph, um, Jesus, and Mary, uh, Simeon, and Anna. So in this recognition of these two wise and profound people, Simeon, an elder in the community known for his wisdom, recognizes through the Spirit, that this is maybe the one we have been anticipating for 800 years, the, the birth of the one, the Messiah. Anna, who's the prophet in this case, she too understands the prophetic history and recognizes in this birth that this is the long-awaited Messiah. These predictions were revelations in the Jewish community, no doubt questioned and concerned and taken in uh, dubious ways. It was a challenge. People had been waiting for a long time. And it's a powerful story. It's a story of authoritarian uh, control. Mary and Joseph called up for a profile of their identity so that they could be controlled. We don't know anything about that in this day and age where we have so many concerns about our identity being controlled. Here it is 2,000 years ago. A story of an authoritarian tyrant killing the innocent children in order to eliminate any threat. A story of Mary and Joseph as refugees needing to flee this tyrant. Uh, they're in a Syrian refugee camp in Egypt, in the Middle East, facing the challenges of being displaced people. It's a story of humble beginnings that the lowest in the economic ladder, whether service people on the front lines or cleaners or health uh, people working in hospitals, people doing deliveries, whatever the humble professions that we might name are the ones who recognize God with us. And it's also the foreigners that recognize God with us. It isn't the elite of that community, the temple crowd. It's those wise people, the Zoroastrians from away, who recognize Jesus in this as a profound new beginning. So at this Christmas time, we tell again this story 
We tell it year after year. We have all heard it throughout our lives. It represents a familiar story. Yet I think as we come into this beginning of the Christian year again, it challenges us with new insights about authority, about liberation, about vulnerability, about how God is with us in intimate and profound and vulnerable ways. So again, we come into this story. May it be blessing to us. May it be comfort and joy. May we share in what the Christ Mass means for us this day. So be it. So we have come together on this Christmas Day to appreciate the goodness of the Christ message born to us anew. We give thanks for the Creator's love of us, the joy invited into this season. We walk in the humble ways of Jesus, and we are filled with the spirit of love. May it be so for us all. Amen. Gloria.